Welcome to the WinSim for Academia webinar. Thank you for joining us today. Dr. Arne Gravdal, Founder and Chief Technology Officer of WinSim, Dr. Xuan Wu, WinSim America's Country Manager, and I, Donna Renamo, Director of Channel Sales and Market Alliances, will talk to you about how WinSim software and its computational fluid dynamics background lead university students to comprehensive understanding of the theories and industrial applications of CFD technology. Through mastering the use of the WinSim modeling tools and applications, graduates will be enabled to assist owner operators around the world to maximize the potential of their wind farms. This session will last one hour. All participants are muted to enhance the presentation. We welcome you to send in questions at any time during the presentations via the chat window. And what we will do is we will follow up after this webinar via email and answer those questions accordingly. OK, thank you. And I hand now this presentation over to Dr. Xuan Wu. Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to WingSim webinar. My name is Xuan Wu, and I'm currently the country manager of WingSim in the United States. Uh, I used to work for the University of Central Florida, so I have some experience on teaching and research program. Today, our topic will be how WingSim can be used as a tool for curriculum and research program in universities and educational organizations. on how WinSim could be a good supplement to curriculum of wind energy education and, when, and why WinSim is abundant ensembles to study safety and its application and why WinSim is a powerful tool to investigate cutting edge techniques involving with wind energy. And Dr. Grafdale will take care of the rest of the, present of the, rest of the presentation. Uh, to discuss more details about WingSim technique and share his experience on WingSim education and WingSim training. Right now, I will start from the first topic. What kind of features make WingSim a good supplement to the curriculum of renewable energy? Um, as we all know, some universities already have the curriculum on wind resource assessment tool. Linear tools have been included in the courses of undergraduates, but only very few universities put safety tools into their curriculum of renewable energy education program. This basically is because linear tools are currently more popular in wind energy industry. They have longer history and easy to handle and fast to obtain the results. But we still have to realize and point out that linear tools will lead to large errors when they are applied into the study of complex terrain. According to the study, according to the study of uh, Ishara Itel, when the, in when the inclination angle of the hill is bigger than 17 degrees, the results obtained from linear tools and a safety tool will show totally different tendency of speed ups. Even for lower inclination angles, we can still see the differences resulting from linear tool and a safety tool. In another word, complex terrain conditions like hills and mountains will disable the applic applic applicable applicability of the linear tool in wind resource assess assessment study. Uh, the differences re resulting from linear tool and a safety tool have been checked and verified by researchers and also by many blind tests organized by the leaders of wind energy industry. For example, the well-known Poland blind test. And now it is almost accepted by the whole industry that for some cases, safety tool could improve the accuracy of the result by 10%, which means a lot for a wind resource assessment study. In case not all participants knew Bulland experiment well, 
I would like to say something more about it. The Bullen experiment was a field campaign for validating numerical model of flu in complex terrain and it was the basis for a unique blind comparison of flu model. Winsim participated in the Bullen experiment conducted as an anonymous blind test. Uh, 50 results were handed in and grouped in four categories, linearized large AD simulations and one and two equations RNS, they know the average Navistokes equations. The last, three, the last three are CFD methods. That means uh, LES, RNS1, and RNS2 uh, belong to uh, CFD methods. Um, we can see that Winsim belongs to the fourth category, two equation RNS, which perform the best. The CFD methods, including Winsim as the best commercial software in the test, show the lowest errors among the various methods. We can see that the top 10 results were obtained from safety models, especially two equation RNS model that Winsim also used this model and performed among the top 10. In addition to improve the accuracy of simulation, the nature of CFD tool also enabled more new features like thermal stability stratification of atmosphere study, forest complex vegetation cover condition study, and the metal scale safety coupling study, etc. All these will definitely enrich the contents of curriculum of renewable energy and lead to a more comprehensive understanding of wind resource assessment study in wind energy industry. We do believe that it is the time for the university students to touch down all this information and get informed about the advantage of safety tool. So I think WinSIM is a good supplement to the current curriculum of renewable energy education program. The second part I would like to say that WinSIM is also an abundant ensemble for safety study, study and safety application. Uh, based on Navistokes equations that describe the flu characteristic of any fluids and the K-epsilon and its variance, including K-omega Wilcox two equation model for turbulence simulation. Winsim provided the mainstream safety ensembles to study safety theory. By adjusting multiply parameters involving with gridding generation, Winsim provided many techniques to change the numbers, the size, the shape of cells to implement body fitting grid, grids and to generate reasonable gridding system which lead to a converged result. All these are very important for university students to learn and to understand the concept of CFD. In addition, embedded visualization and a professional GLView tool in WinSIM enabled users to display the simulation results in a vivid way. All flu variables like velocity components, scalars and vectors, turbulence intensities, directions and inflow angles could be displayed easily in WinSIM. With GLView2 in WinSIM, users could trace the virtual particles in flu fields and even generate the sense of wind park before it is built up. All in all, from equations, gridding generations, algorithms, solved selections, to the post-processing to display all relevant variables, WinSIM could be utilized as abundant ensembles for students to study safety theory and its application in wind energy industry. Uh, in addition to be used in teaching, WinSIM can also be used to investigate those cutting edge techniques in wind energy industry. From here, I will hand this presentation over to Dr. Gravdal, who is the founder of WinSIM company and also the CTO of WinSIM now. He will share his, his experience on WinSIM training and WinSIM education and he will introduce more details about WinSIM on research program.
Thank you, Sven. I've already been introduced. My name is Arne Gravdal. So I will take you through the next steps of this uh, presentation. And uh, I will start with uh, the development of our training program that started with commercial users and now uh, has also been adopted by uh, many academic institutes. Then I will share some thoughts about uh, how we do the wind characterization, how we do the simulations. What I see is that uh, a lot of people uh, actually tune uh, their models and then uh, if these models are good or bad, it's not always revealed because apparently we are able to reproduce the measurements. Then I will go through some uh, research activities where we have been involved and where we think we could have uh, great help from uh, academia. Uh, it will be a few slides on these topics, turbulence modeling, atmospheric stability, forest modeling, wake modeling, layout optimization, mesomicrocoupling, power forecasting, and at the end, uh, coupling with uh, remote sensing devices. And then uh, at the end, uh, some thoughts about how we can reduce uncertainty, how we have to share data in order to um, evaluate the errors we actually do when uh, we uh, um, use a numerical model. The very last part uh, is then taken by, by Donna. So first, a bit about our training program. WinSim was launched in 2003. At the same time, we also set up a basic training over two days uh, to uh, uh, allow uh, engineers to be familiar with the CFD method, uh, what kind of uh, thing they have to look into in order to set up uh, good models. This basic training was uh, very soon um, expanded and we had uh, an advanced usage and concepts over two days. So the typical uh, would be that uh, uh, after half a year, after a year, when a user had some experience on their own, they will uh, attend uh, an advanced uh, training and there he would share his experience so far. So this was at the beginning partly done as a workshop. But as time uh, evolved, we got more and more software, more and more material and theory to, uh, uh, to, to, to talk about. Uh, the advanced usage and concept uh, was a, a pretty packed course as well. Uh, since 2012, we have also had a one-day uh, exam. Uh, so uh, you could be a certified WinSim user. So, um, this is the setup we, we have today. And we have 25% of our licenses sold is used uh, within academia. So it's a large group of people that uh, uses WinSim in their research. And we also see that uh, various uh, bachelor and master programs within uh, wind power or renewable energy have adopted uh, WinSim uh, on um, the um, uh, lower levels. And in addition, it's used uh, within research. And here it's an, uh, once more the list that I, I mentioned and that I will go through uh, step by step. But before I do this, I, I would also like to introduce uh, Norwegian University, the uh, Norwegian University of Life Science. Uh, it's uh, one of eight uh, accredited uh, universities in Norway. Uh, it has 5,000 students and uh, 1,700 employees. It's located uh, with two campuses, uh, one campus in the central part of Oslo and one just south of Oslo. Since uh, four years, it has had a master program within renewable energy. So why do I present this university? Well, the fact is that uh, the last year I've uh, had a 20% position as an associate professor at this university. And my responsibility uh, is a course within wind resource assessment. So typically we spend uh, one week uh, on, uh, in a data lab and the students uh, are trained how to design uh, profitable wind farms to optimize the, the energy production. And in addition to that, uh, I also supervise master and PhD students and take part in research programs. The pictures here is taken this uh, summer 
Uh, it's the, the class of master students that visited uh, our national wind energy center in the mid part of Norway called Smörla. So some, uh, some uh, very basic things, wind characterization, tuning or proper physical modeling. Well, there is only two ways that we can get knowledge about the, the wind. We can measure or we can simulate. And when it comes to measurements, uh, we can broadly divide in two groups. We have the point sensors, like the cough anemometer, and now uh, more and more widely used, these remote sensing devices, uh, which gives us so much more information. Uh, but they uh, have also, of course, some, uh, some uh, higher uncertainties. Then it's the simulations. And here, the simulations uh, uses a wide range of methods, as uh, as uh, Shuen described for you. And of course, uh, CFD is uh, towards the higher end uh, when it comes to the sophistication level. Then I would like to share some thoughts uh, about uh, how we actually do the, the simulations. Because, uh, of course, we have measurements, and we have to calibrate our simulations against measurements. And often there are more than one measurement as well. And then we detect uh, that we uh, will have discrepancies, and then the question is, how do we handle these discrepancies? So this is what I illustrate with this uh, sketch. I have uh, the uh, blue uh, vector indicating the results from the simulation, and the orange vector is the results from the measurements. And I have uh, calibrated against uh, the uh, measurements on the left side here. And then I have a second measurement, and I have a discrepancy. So what do we do? Well, in the very, very old days, and I know that this is actually, sorry, this is actually how we have uh, developed the first wind farm in Norway. We simply exaggerated the terrain elevation to get a fit uh, between uh, the both uh, measurements. This is very brutal modeling, and it's, of course, not very sound physical modeling. But anyway, this was done uh, quite some years ago when the first wind farm was constructed in Norway. Today, we still uh, tune uh, towards roughness. Here, illustrated by a, a forest, uh, this will have a great impact on the profiles, on the shear. So uh, a lot of people simply play with the, the, the roughness in order to reproduce the measurements. And all of you that have followed the development within uh, uh, flow modeling uh, in recent years know that stability and stability uh, issues have become uh, a hot topic, so to say. And uh, we also understand that now people use the stability to tune uh, in order to reproduce measurements. Of course, this is not a recommended practice because it will hide for us that we actually continue to use a poorly validated model and uh, models not based on sound physics. And this will not be revealed in a way if we continue to do it uh, like this. So uh, I think that very, very often when people present what apparently seems to be very good results, it might be that they get right for the wrong reasons. So our answer is, of course, to add more physics. So here is just uh, two examples. First, uh, it's a wavy boundary channel. Uh, here the flow comes in from left. And what we will observe here is that uh, uh, gradually we will have a boundary layer that uh, is developed. But I remind you that if you use a simple tool, then the conditions at the, the third hilltop and the fourth hilltop will be the same. So it's only by using uh, CFD uh, and transport equation that you capture such effects. Winsim is a Norwegian company, so you could think that this is a Norwegian mountain fjords uh, and mountain tops, and of course it could be, but it will of course be exactly the same in Finland where you would have lake, forest, lake, forest in patches. 
and then the same kind of boundary uh, layers will develop and you will have quite a complex flow field uh, after uh, some uh, periods with uh, swapping uh, roughness uh, patterns. Another case, wind again coming in from left, a small uh, hill uh, on the left side here. What we see here is a stratified atmosphere and a gravity wave that is developed uh, on the lee side of the hill. So this was a study done uh, with WinSim at the University of Edinburgh some years ago. And when you have a situation like this, you will actually find that you have the highest wind speed on the lee side. And of course, we know from many places around the world that this is things that is observed, and uh, it would be possible to also model it. But most people uh, neglect this uh, type of physics and uh, don't introduce it in their uh, attempt to, to model the wind flows. Then I will go through these uh, research activities that we see as uh, that we think should be of interest for universities, and for sure it would be of great interest for us if people would uh, uh, attack some of these uh, problems. So we start with the uh, turbulence modeling. Schwen already introduced uh, the Boolean experiment. Uh, what he showed you was uh, uh, results for the mean wind speed, and uh, a lot of uh, people did quite well when it comes to the mean wind speeds, so did we. Uh, we didn't uh, match uh, that good the turbulence level. Uh, it was seen that the turbulence level from the standard K epsilon model was a bit too low compared with the measurements. So uh, uh, we uh, rerun the cases and we looked at alternative uh, um, turbulence models. So uh, for the Boolean experience, we could see that the K omega model apparently uh, reproduced the, the level of the turbulence better than the standard K epsilon model. Stability, I've already showed you an example of stability. So here is another one that uh, simply shows the, the qualitative behavior uh, of the flow when it passes over a cosine hill. So uh, on the left here, uh, uh, on the top left, you see a um, top view of the cosine hill. So the cosine hill is the black spot here, and there is a section through the, the center of the cosine hill. Uh, and then um, uh, this vertical section is shown here on the uh, lower left. So let's first look at the flow uh, in this vertical section. Here we have displayed the velocity component along the x-axis. And what we can see here on the lower left is that we get a, a very nice speed up when the flow passes over the hill, as expected. But if we, instead of running uh, with a neutral atmosphere, which is our uh, reference here, uh, introduce a stable atmosphere, then we will see that the speed up will be very, very much reduced. And the reason is that the flow doesn't go over the hill, but it goes around the hill instead. And that's uh, the, the thing we can see in the upper uh, plots here. Uh, here we display the components of the flow along the y-axis. And it is a, a larger tendency of going around in the stable case with this uh, deep red and light uh, white areas compared with what we observe with a, a neutral stratification. That was a, um, kind of an academic case. Uh, we have also uh, been able to reproduce this in a, a real case. This is a wind farm on the west coast of Norway, where we have a situation with stable stratification when the wind comes from the land side, uh, but when it comes from the sea side, the offshore side, uh, which is uh, from sector 210 up to 300, then it's mainly in neutral conditions. So uh, if we look at some of the profiles from various wind directions, we can see that uh, we are able to capture the log-like profile when the wind passes along the, this ridge. We can also capture the speed up when it comes in uh, perpendicular to the ridge uh, from north. And that's a neutral situation. 
Whereas if it comes from the opposite direction, then it's from the land side. And then uh, our simulation will overshoot the observations. We get a too high uh, speed up close to the ground, which is not seen in the measured results. Then we have the possibility, again, to uh, run this uh, case with a stable atmosphere. And uh, uh, we uh, have some red profiles here, and that is if we run the, the case with uh, a stable atmosphere. And as you can see, there is quite a large uh, um, deviation uh, between the neutral and stable case. And again, this, the stable case uh, uh, is uh, uh, the, the best one that uh, reproduce uh, the measurements. Forest modeling. We started to model uh, a forest back in 2005, and we used this simple setup to validate uh, the model. So uh, uh, on the left here, you see a top view. Uh, wind comes in again from left. The gray area here is an inlet zone. And then we have a green area, which is the forest. And we monitor the profiles uh, some kilometers downstream into the forest. This is a vertical view of the, the grid. The forest is only 10 meter high, so it's down uh, at the very first cells here. And then we have a large area on top, like a buffer zone, which is actually as high as 1,000 meter. Probably it wouldn't be necessary, but anyway, this was the, the setup at that time. A forest model consists of some model constant. We have used porosity. We have used some friction forces. We have used uh, turbulence. And uh, back in 2005, then uh, we tested various types of forest with uh, various densities or porosities. And we tuned some of these friction coefficients in order to reproduce some measurements that, was, uh, uh, that we have uh, from uh, canopies. So uh, the plot here at the bottom shows velocity profiles. Uh, the canopy uh, is uh, normalized. So you have uh, from zero or, uh, and below. Uh, you are inside the canopy, and from uh, sorry, from one and below, you are inside the canopy, and from one and above, you are outside the canopy. And the various test cases will give us quite a large spread in the profiles above the canopy. So we see that our model constant actually ranged uh, over several decades. And that is, in a way, a bit uh, a disappointment uh, because it implies that you have an enormous sensitivity on how you set the, the model constant. So this is still an area uh, where we do um, uh, uh, lack knowledge. Uh, we have just got an excellent data set from a, a large developer in Europe. Uh, wind projected wind farms, I must say, they are no, there is no turbines there, and that's good uh, at the moment, but projected uh, wind farms in forested area with both uh, remote sensing measurements and uh, high mid mast influenced by the forest and not influenced by the forest. So this uh, is still uh, uh, research uh, that we do uh, in that area. There is a close link between uh, forest modeling and wave modeling. The actuator disk concept uh, uses uh, much of the same physics as we have in the forest. Uh, you might say in a simplified way that we have taken up uh, uh, the, uh, a forest and make, uh, made a rotor. Uh, of course, it's not exactly the same. Here we expect to have another type of turbulence generation that uh, uh, we try to reproduce the effect from each of the rotors, obviously. So, so that will be a difference. But many of the other things are very similar to uh, what we have in the forest model. So why do we uh, apply this actuated disk? Uh, it's a quite heavy method, computational-wise, to, uh, to introduce. Well, the fact is that uh, the tools that is used in the industry today is simple analytical models 
that uh, works well for one single turbine in a flat area. But as soon as you have wake-wake interaction, as soon as you have wake-terrain interaction, and also uh, like thermal effects, then these analytical models uh, uh, doesn't cope with uh, those situations. So for this reason, we think that uh, the actuator disk could be an uh, attractive uh, engineering tools in the years to come uh, if we are able to set all these uh, model constants. We currently have uh, um, an industrial PhD student working uh, uh, out from the University of Uppsala in Sweden that looks into the actuator disk. Some years ago, back in uh, 2011, then we tested it on Hornsrev, uh, one of the first uh, offshore wind farms in Denmark. They have, um, uh, there is a public uh, database with um, uh, production data from Hornsrev, so it's a very much used uh, validation case. Then I will say a few words about uh, layout optimization. And I will just tell you that uh, back uh, before we launched WindSim in 2003, we did some validation cases. At that time, uh, most of the wind farms we looked at was in Denmark, in Germany, and even in simple sites in Denmark, we observed that there was quite a large variability uh, when it comes to production within a wind farm. In a quite simple site, we could see 25% variability uh, and at that time, people claimed that this is due to wake effects. But uh, at that time, we didn't have wake models in, in, in WinSim, and we could still reproduce the variability when it comes to production. So we concluded that this is not only wake effects, this is for short terrain effects. And uh, we could uh, play with uh, the existing layout. We could increase the production by 10% in one of these wind farms we looked at. So uh, it was clear to us that uh, uh, with proper uh, wind fields, you could probably gain a lot uh, uh, in designing more uh, profitable wind farms. Today, we have a tool called Park Optimizer. Park Optimizer works in this way. You run your WinSim project and you have established the numerical wind database. So this is the CFD results. Then you uh, um, introduce that into the Park Optimizer and you do the following four steps. First, you do the project constraints. This is simply the area where you are allowed to have turbines. So this is the wind farm area. Uh, but in addition, there could be areas that should be excluded. It could be a lake, it could be too close to a house due to sound, things like that. But uh, of course, also the flow itself uh, could violate some of the IC uh, criterias. So there will be an automatic check on the IC compliance. So that will be our step number two here. And then you can start the optimization procedure. And of course, one of the main thing you would like to know is how many turbines would be the optimum to have inside my area. Uh, and then it's uh, also an economical optimization towards uh, the net present value. And then of course, the output will be uh, uh, the optimum layout. I told you about our experience when we started with the 10% increase in a relatively simple site in Denmark. Uh, now we have looked into this once more, uh, and as I'm sure most of you know, to do a validation based on production data, it's quite demanding. First of all, you need to get hold of the data, you need to clean the data, you need to understand how the wind farm has been operated, has some of the turbines been derated. There is a lot of questions that uh, in some cases can be quite hard to answer. So what we have done here is not a, a proper validation, but we have looked at seven wind farms around the world. Uh, we have found them in, in, in Google Earth. We have found the location of each turbine. And we have put in these uh, locations in a light version of WinSim called WinSim Express, which sets up the model automatically. And we have calibrated the results based on downloaded metadata. 
and then we get an estimate of the annual energy production. And this might be 10% off, even 20, 30% off. We don't know exactly, but still we think that they represent something uh, which uh, uh, could be the starting point for an optimization. So this is what we have done. Based on the rectangular area where the uh, original turbines was located, we have defined this as the, uh, a load area to be used. And then uh, we have started the park optimizer and we have looked at the increased AEP. And here are the results uh, of these seven wind parks. You can see that we have a 5% increase, a 6%, 4%, 10%, and so on. And there is an outlier here. And of course, it's a kind of artificial exercise because the park owner might have some other constraints that uh, was not uh, uh, that we didn't see. So the outlier here of 30% uh, increase is, uh, should be neglected. But uh, anyway, we think it's a clear indication that to have a proper uh, wind field and to start an optimization uh, even early before um, the permitting uh, process uh, uh, will require that the turbine position should be fixed. This is something that uh, uh, we should look into and can look into uh, with uh, a tool like Park Optimizer. Some words about meso microcoupling. This is a, a really a, an exciting area, and it's a very it's a great great challenge. So this is just an example of some tests we have done. Here uh, we have actually used the virtual MetMask data from the Met Office in UK. Uh, at some sites in, as you can see here, in Croatia and Italy. And again, we have used Winsim Express and we have looked at how we can uh, downscale and hopefully reproduce the, the measurements here. We had 11 uh, met masts uh, with more than 21 years of uh, accumulated uh, measurement data. Of course, this meso microcoupling is at the heart of the, the problem when it comes to forecasting. And I will share some, uh, some ideas also when it comes to forecasting. Uh, you might say that the, the simplest way you can do a forecast is to have an, uh, some uh, um, meteorological model running on a global or, or a meso scale. And then you can have a wind farm. You can regard the wind farm uh, with a, an equivalent um, uh, power curve. And you can just feed in what you obtain from the meteorological model. And you can create a, a, a power production. That would be the simplest of all forecasts. Of course, uh, at the heart of any forecasting procedure, there is a statistical method today. And here I've illustrated it by this small symbol that could represent an artificial neural net, uh, network method. What we have done is to uh, use uh, the CFD on the micro scale. So instead of uh, training uh, the, uh, and create the bridge between the large scale and directly the production, we uh, train the wind. And we use the CFD to uh, uh, transfer the wind information out to each turbine position. And then we could also uh, use um, an artificial neural network technique to train again on the power produced by each turbine. Of course, when the wind farm has been running for a period, then we will also uh, be able to establish empirical power curves. And that could also be introduced in our forecasting system. And even better, if there is online data, this is also something that will uh, um, increase the accuracy. It could be online wind data, or it could be online data on uh, power. So to summarize, uh, here is our forecasting model. It's a bit detailed to go through now. So I just uh, say that we have a setup period where we uh, train uh, the neural network against historical data. We do quite detailed uh, CFD models. And in order to run this in a fast way during the uh, forecasting mode, we create lookup tables. 
So this is how we do uh, the, the, the CFD downscaling. Of course, the wake modeling is not that demanding, so that is also done in the forecasting mode. And as I said, if we have um, uh, production data, we can also train on uh, hist uh, the historical uh, production data. We can introduce the empirical power curve. And finally, it's the online data that uh, will also uh, increase the accuracy. Then at the very end, uh, some words about uh, remote sensing. We know that if you use a remote sensing device in a complex terrain, then one of the basic assumptions when you do uh, remote sensing, at least the way it's uh, sketched here uh, from one position, then uh, you will assume that the flow field is uniform within the, the area where you uh, measure the wind. And this is a faulty assumption. And for this reason, some errors are introduced. We looked into those errors. Uh, a test was set up in Greece, a 100 meter high met mast uh, with a cup anemometer, and this was compared against uh, a LIDAR. At this test site, uh, there were some terrain effects. Uh, at the top here, you see the elevation map, and then you see the vertical wind speed at 100 meters height. There is a small gray spot in here, and that's the location of the met mast. And the uh, LIDAR will measure in uh, a circular area around this gray point. And here there are some variability when it comes to the vertical wind speed. And the vertical wind speed is uh, the, uh, proportional to the first uh, order error uh, that you will obtain when you do the measurement with uh, a LIDAR. So it was actually observed that there was a discrepancy between the LIDAR and the copometer of 6.7%. But after uh, running through the raw data with our correction routine, we saw that this uh, error was reduced to only 0.3%. This was our, our first uh, validation, and it was, of course, very, very encouraging to see uh, this uh, very, very good results. Then, uh, before I hand it over to Donna, I will just uh, share uh, some thoughts about how we can, uh, how it's necessary that the whole community work together in order to uh, evaluate the errors that we do uh, with uh, numerical modeling. I started to say that we, we do tuning. So here is another uh, foil uh, illustrating the same. Along this uh, ridge, we have uh, measured something. Here we have the uh, light blue, which is the reality. Uh, it could be wind speed, it could be turbulence, it could be any quantity, but this is the reality uh, over this ridge. Then we measure. And I, on purpose, made the measurements a bit away from reality. Uh, we are always asked to reproduce measurements. In some cases, we uh, observe that there is something wrong. And even uh, by looking at our uh, simulation results, we can tell the, the, the people that have done the measurements that here you have to go and look at your wind van. There must be a, a wrong setting. Uh, it's 20, uh, 20 degrees offset here that we cannot, cannot explain. But that's, uh, that's another discussion, actually. Then we do some simulations. And if we have a poorly validated model, we might end up in this situation. Again, it's calibrated, so it will fit exactly the measurements at one location. And then we will do our tuning, uh, whether it's height, elevation, roughness, stability. Uh, there are many ways. And people do this tuning, so they reproduce the measurements. But of course, we have a nonlinear system here. So it might be that we tune ourselves away from reality. So uh, this is really not a good situation. Of course, our dream is to have good models and uh, where we don't have to, to tune. We solve a nonlinear problem. 
then uh, it's natural that we uh, need to uh, use a nonlinear uh, method. And as I said, the tuning can tune you away from reality. So uh, the way forward must be good validated model. How do we obtain these good validated models? It's only if we can share uh, 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 our errors that we can obtain this. So the whole community have to share uh, cross-prediction errors. We have asked our users to take part in uh, what we call a validation program. So whenever there is more than two measurements at their sites, we ask them to send us back in an anonymous way their cross-prediction errors. And of course, the cross-prediction error will uh, 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 increase with increased terrain complexity. It might also be that it will increase if you have done uh, a coarse model, if you have measurements which are far apart, uh, these kind of things. So we will ask for some information, but it will be anonymous, and it will not be possible to identify where the, the wind farm is located. So we hope that after a while, it might take actually some years, that we can establish a plot like this with cross-prediction errors uh, uh, against terrain complexity. And I'm sure that this is something that will be appreciated by banks. Uh, then uh, hopefully we can also tell that by doing uh, good modeling, you can reduce uncertainty. You will increase the P90 values, and you will get better financing and hopefully be able to uh, construct wind farms uh, with uh, uh, better profitability. Okay, so with this, I hand uh, it uh, back to you, Donna. Can you take control? I should do that, but before I do that, thank you, Arne, thank you, Schwen. There are a couple questions that came in that relate to your presentation, Arne, so maybe we have some time here. Maybe you can address them now. One, the question was the Mara data, does it have a cost? No, the Mero data is for free. Okay. We, we have also developed a downloader uh, that uh, takes it directly into the uh, our format, so you can uh, uh, input, uh, uh, import it directly into WinSet. Okay. And then, uh, second question: uh, What type of turbines are you configuring, and how do you configure the turbines? For us, uh, a, a turbine is um, a device that have a power curve uh, and uh, a trust coefficient, and also a sound level if you would like to see the sound propagation. But basically, it's a power curve and uh, a trust coefficient. So this you can supply. We have a small library uh, with uh, turbines, but uh, we uh, have also a small form. So you can, of course, use any kind of turbines. Okay, thank you. And I'll just remind everybody uh, that we will be posting this presentation uh, early next week on the WinSim YouTube site. So you can, it will be recorded or it's being recorded and you'll be able to refer to them again. So one moment, I'm just going to come back to my screen. So in summary, uh, market position, uh, as Arna mentioned, uh, we uh, the software was uh, first commercially available and launched in 2003. Since then, we've had some uh, steady growth all the way to date. Um, we have um, leading turbine manufacturers, developers, consulting companies, and research, research institutes around the world that are using this technology in over 50 countries. And here you see some of the uh, prestigious names um, on the right side of the screen there that are using the technology. Um, so the software suite is sold the core software being WinSim, and then we have various add-on modules to that core platform, including the Park Optimizer, the Power Forecasting module, the WinSim Express. We also have a cloud version, uh, which you'll find on the WinSim website uh, for those that want to have a quick um, AEP um, assessment done without um, owning the software. You can utilize uh, this cloud version uh, for that purpose. and 
all of these are available for your use today. The software suite um, is utilized throughout the WIND project time span. So anywhere from the pre-construction um, to, to, to construction and post-construction. So screening, uh, measurement campaign design, site suitability out to the bankable AEP. And then um, on the post-construction side, very exciting is this new uh, power forecasting um, uh, uh, work that we're doing, our technology solution. And before we leave today, I just want to tell everybody about a promotion we're running uh, between now and the end of the year. It's quite exciting. Uh, it's, uh, the software package is heavily discounted for uh, use within academia. So we are offering for $4,500 uh, an academic license, single user, or the classroom version, which enables up to 50 users to uh, utilize the technology. These are annual subscri subscription rates. And if you're interested, you can contact either myself or directly to sales at winsim.com. And also, as part of this promotion, we are inviting, assuming you take advantage of the promotion, we are inviting you to a one-day advanced training course for no charge that will take place in tandem with the AWEA Win Resource Assessment uh, Show in Orlando, which that takes place 2nd and 3rd of December. This advanced training will be on December 5th. And also an invitation to join us for our user meeting, which takes place on December 4th at the same location as the Win Resource Assessment uh, Show, and that's in Florida. And that's going to be quite exciting because it will be an advanced information share among some of our most prestigious users in, in the Americas region, and them demonstrating how they're really pushing the WinSIM technology um, to provide great solutions um, for, for their companies. Okay, with that, we are going to conclude our webinar today. We thank you all for joining, and like I say, this will be posted early next week uh, on the WinSim YouTube site. Thank you.